lovely spring morning. First, turn them off. If you have them, turn them off. Today, we're pleased to have Mr. Martin Wasserman. Marty was born and raised in Florida. Thank you. Let's get close to it. Marty was born and raised in Newark, New Jersey. He received his BS degree in pharmacy from Rutgers and was awarded MA and PH degrees in pharmacology and toxicology from the University of Texas Medical Branch, Galveston. He held positions of responsibility from companies such as Pfizer, GlaxoSmithKline, Bristol Myers Squibb, and Hoffman LaRoche. In addition, Dr. Wasserman has served as an adjunct and visiting professor at several universities. Most recently, Martin was a drug research and development consultant and an, and an advisor for a number of pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies. Martin and his wife Cheryl, right here in the front row, moved to Friendship Village November 2021. You can learn more about the Wassermans in this month's Villager. Please welcome Dr. Martin Wasserman who will discuss my career as a pharmacist, to a pharmacologist, to a consultant. Marty. Thank you very much, Dave. Can everybody hear me back there? Yes. Okay. Uh, it's amazing when we put together this talk. I've given many talks at many different countries, and yet I've never talked. You can take that off. Oh, I can take that off, good. Yeah. Many talks in many different countries, and I've never talked about myself. It's always the work that I'm doing. So this was very unique to get, be given this opportunity, especially because we've only been here a short period of time. But as I begin, let me just tell you some of these words to make sure that we're clear on them. The pharmacist, well, we all go to a pharmacy and we have an idea what a pharmacist does. The pharmacist that I grew up with and then worked in a pharmacy for uh, were a little different than they were today. Uh, I actually prepare medications in a pharmacy, although many of you probably go back to uh, having a prescription being filled meaning they had to prepare substances that went into capsules, or went into tablets, or went into suppositories, or went into liquids, or ointments, or creams. And that was my job in a pharmacy. In a pharmacy, they take pills from one bottle, put it into another bottle, or they take one liquid, put it into another bottle, and they slap a label on it. I don't want mean to demean the Nobel noble profession of ph pharmacy uh, because I think it is very important to the community, the work that they do. But it wasn't exactly what I had wanted to do all my career. So after eight years in one pharmacy, and I'll get back to this, but eight years in one pharmacy in New Jersey, I decided to go to graduate school or medical school and seek a degree in one of the courses that I specifically enjoyed in my pharmacy school training, and that was pharmacology. Now, whereas a pharmacist dispenses medication to treat diseases, a pharmacologist studies the mechanism of action. How does a drug work? And where does a drug work in your body? What are the side effects of drugs? And how do we make them better? We try to get a further understanding about the drug, and then you can make the next generation that would be safer and perhaps more effective. So I studied for four years at the University of 
Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, which was a medical school, it still is, but there was no graduate school per se, so on my records it says I'm a graduate of a medical school. And it used to confuse our children and say, wait a minute, you have a PhD next to your name, not an MD, but how did you get a PhD at a medical school? And I had to go through the whole story with them. And for most of my professional career, I worked in the pharmaceutical industry, and I'll get back and share some of those uh, names that might be familiar with you, especially the ones of yesteryear. And then lastly, when I retired in 2005, at my request to retire, we were in Atlanta at the time, at a small biotechnology company where I had been the senior vice president for research and development and the chief scientific officer. That's a very sexy title because uh, I only had a group of about 30 people reporting to me. But when I retired, the stockholders in that company were very concerned. The company was doing very well at the time. Here I am leading research and development, and now he's chosen to retire, quote unquote. There must be something going on there, and there wasn't. I just wanted to uh, let the company know that time has come. I was in mid-60s, I want to retire, and I want to go enjoy the rest of my life uh, outside of working for the pharmaceutical industry. Both of our children were living in California, my wife and I were living in Atlanta, Georgia, and we said, this doesn't make sense. So soon after I retired, we found a way to get to California, and for the past 15 years, we've been living in Valencia, California, which is a suburb of uh, Los Angeles. Valencia is noted for uh, Magic Mountain, an amusement park of the Six Flags derivation for any of you that have been to Los Angeles. And we had an enjoyable time there, made many friends, and then we realized time has come that we have to consider moving to a life care facility for both of us and both of our city. And where do you go? It's an open book. You can choose anywhere, any state. Where do we go? And the main decision that we reached was number one, we had been here before because the first company I worked for was the Upjohn Company. We spent nine and a half years right here in Kalamazoo. We had a great time here, but for better opportunities for my career, we had moved. Also, while living in Kalamazoo, we showed such interest in the community that Cheryl's my wife, her mother, father, and three brothers all moved to Kalamazoo. So the whole family was here. I was going to say, but as smart as I was, we moved away afterward. <laughs> but uh, one, of, one of the brothers actually is here, and that's Andy. You all know Andy Price, Andrew. Uh, I nicknamed him the mayor of Friendship Village because of all the work he does for everyone. And Cheryl, I'll get back to in a few moments also. So I'll take you through the journey of what we did on each step, and then finish it with what our hobbies are and what our love in our free time have been and what we hope to do and continue in the future. This is where it all started. This is North Beth Israel Hospital, one of the top 10 hospitals in the country. And I was born in November, as was stated, and now just turned 80. And uh, I mentioned North Beth Israel Hospital because number one, it was one of the first hospitals in the country that did heart transplants. So it's a very prestigious hospital. Number two, three years after I was born in this hospital, Cheryl was born in this hospital. Now, we didn't know one another, the families didn't know one another, so it was purely by coincidence. And it wasn't until another 20 years or so later that we got together and eventually married. And after 56 years, I believe it is, I better be right, uh, we go back all the way to Newark, New Jersey, which academically, for the high school I went to, then the college, very highly ranked academically in the nation. And we were pleased to be in Newark.
until unfortunately 1967, it was spelled doom for the city temporarily when they had the riots in Newark. They had them in Detroit also and some other cities. And people were escaping. And we had gone to medical school in 1968, so we were getting out just in time. But I just want you to see it's an ultra-modern hospital in what at one time was a very prestigious area to live in and then turned into more of a ghetto and we were getting out at the time. And now with this new facility, they're bringing people back to Newark. At my first job as a pharmacist, it was in a city called Elizabeth, New Jersey. Now Elizabeth, New Jersey is actually the home of Newark Airport. For any of you that have ever flown into Newark Airport, it's not in Newark, it's in Elizabeth, New Jersey. And the biggest pharmacy in Elizabeth is also the most prestigious pharmacy in the state of New Jersey for the number of prescriptions, the number of patients they have as clients to work with. And it was called Shores Medical Service. And I worked there eight years as a pharmacist. Some of it while I was going to school, some of it when I was an intern pharmacist, and then a registered pharmacist. And the management of the store thought I was going to be there for the rest of my life. And the decision was made that I wasn't, and they were disappointed, but supportive of me going back to school. In this case, a medical school. One specific uh, thing happened there that was life-changing was that the owner of the store had to hire someone to work on our cosmetic counter for a summer vacation that many people took. And he interviewed a number of people. And I remember coming into the pharmacy where I was dispensing the medications, and he said, I'm bringing in someone today for an interview. I don't want you going near this person, because I think I'm going to hire this person, because she's a very attractive young woman, and I don't want there to be any disruption in her activities or yours. Well, yes, as you read it at my mind, that's where I met Cheryl. So I do owe something to the pharmacy as an anecdote, uh, and she's been with me ever since. In one of my remaining years with the pharmacy, I got that dreaded letter uh, from the draft, and it was during the Vietnam War, saying, Uncle Sam wants to see you uh, in Fort Dix, New Jersey, and they gave me a month, a week's notice. And we were concerned, what do, you, what do I do now? I have a new bride, and now I'm being drafted. What happens, plus I'm losing my job. So lucky for me, in Elizabeth, New Jersey, there was a National Guard, Armory, and Unit that was such that they supported all medical activities within the Army. Well, medical activities, here I am. It's a pharmacist, he can use me doing anything. They loved the idea. They had me sworn in on the same day I visited the National Guard. They told the Army people, which would have been a two-year commitment, I'm now tied up with the National Guard. Don't bother me anymore. And then I went away for six months active duty and uh, six months for uh, advanced infantry training, which basically was going away. I had gone to San Antonio, Texas to teach all of the medics who were going out in the field in Vietnam how to use the equipment that was given to them and how to be good medics out in the and it was while I was in San Antonio that Cheryl and I made the decision that when I came back to the pharmacy that kept the position open for me, we would make a decision to go on to medical school. Now, there were two pharmacists that worked with me at this pharmacy, both of whom worked for a company called Shearing Plow in New Jersey. But at night, one or two nights a week, they used to moonlight in the pharmacy in which I worked. And each of those pharmacists kept drilling into my head, you don't want to do this for the next 50 years of your life. Go back to graduate school, get your PhD, get a job in the pharmaceutical industry, and everyone would be happy. 
so we took their advice and we went to one of the schools that was recommended to me was the university of texas medical branch this is the original medical school for the university of texas it's the oldest one of all the medical schools that are in texas and it was built and opened in 1896 my laboratory see it's the second set of windows right here and i show you this because I spent four years there doing work for a master's degree and then a PhD in pharmacology, which again studies the action of drugs, how the drug affects you and how your body affects the drugs also, pharmacokinetics. But one anecdote that I, I've often told Joan and her friends was while I was a graduate student and I was preparing different solutions to work with my experiments, I put an equation on a bullet board, a chalkboard, we called them back then. And it was a long equation with important ingredients and how much and everything. And so that the nighttime help didn't erase it, I put, please leave as is. And they did while I was in graduate school. No one touched that board. That was Wasserman's board. Well, when I graduated and I moved on to my career in the pharmaceutical industry, I came back and was invited back about six or seven years later, and they wanted to walk me through my old laboratory. And you walk into the laboratory, and the first thing that struck me was, they were my equations on my wall. So somebody was very faithful, and they listened. Don't erase. They left it there. Should have taken a picture at that time. But I want you to see this is a beautiful structure. It's been modified several times. And what most people who are native Galvestonians uh, think about the building is it is one of the few buildings that withstood the 1900 storm, which many of you have probably have read about, uh, which was a hurricane and tornado that ripped through the island. And it took 9,000, something like 8,000 or 9,000 people along with it. And uh, it's the single biggest disaster, natural disaster, in our country's history. Not something to be proud of, but that building stood as you see it right now. And that's where I did all my research for my doctorate. One other thing happened in Galveston, which was monumental to us, was that our daughter was born there, our first daughter. She's now 51 years old, and she's a clinical psychologist, she has her doctorate. But because she was born in Galveston, which is an island in southeast Texas, off the coast of, uh, right near Houston, they call her a BOI. Anyone from Texas knows what that is, it's like royalty. It stands for born on the island, BOI. So she, for the rest of her life, and right now, she lives in Vancouver, British Columbia. But when she meets people and they say, well, where, where do you come from? Where, where are you born? So I'm a B-O-I. That was very important to her. So that was a very big uh, occasion for us. Since I'm showing some pictures of uh, places to live or places to work, I have to show you this. This was our first home in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Gee, we're in Kalamazoo now. But this was taken, this picture right here, in 1972. And it was my first job in the pharmaceutical industry. As a graduate student, I was making a presentation, I believe it was in Atlantic City. And people come up to the speakers after their presentations, and they talk to them about the science, and um, would you be interested in collaborating in something? Just a graduate student. And one individual in particular, his name was Dr. Michael Bach. His wife was Shirley Bach. They were preeminent people here in the Kalamazoo community. He came up to me and he said, are you interested in working in the pharmaceutical industry? And I said, sure, that would be great, but I'm only in my second year of graduate school right now. Let me lock you in. It's like a draft choice for football or baseball. They want to lock me in right now. And I said, well, that would be great. Well, as it occurred, I got my degree on a Saturday afternoon Monday morning, 
I was working for the Upjohn Company, and I believe the number was 301 Henrietta Street. I have yet to find Henrietta Street again, because now I think it's called John Street, or maybe I'm mixing up the names of the streets with my return back. So this is my first interest and first uh, activity in the pharmaceutical industry was because the Upjohn Company made me an offer two years before I graduated. And I came here, and I loved it, and this was our first house on a street called, and we didn't know much about the streets here, Bronson Boulevard. <laughs> and then I find out Bronson Boulevard is at one of the preferred areas in Kalamazoo, and that was great. The back of this house, which I'm not showing, backs up to the country club, the Kalamazoo Country Club. So a beautiful area. Grass, I didn't mow that. Somebody else must have mowed that. And the best part of living here, we had our second child. But this child was born at Borges Hospital. And to this date, he reminds people, and they say, well, where do you come from? Because he lives in the Los Angeles area, Culver City now. He says, well, I'm, and he proudly says it, I was born in Kalamazoo, and yes, there really is in Kalamazoo, and I was born at Borges Hospital. So I have one child born in Galveston as a BOI, another child born in Borges Hospital, Kalamazoo, Michigan. Kalamazoo? Yes, there really is Kalamazoo. So I wanted you to see our house. One of the first things we did when we moved in, which is just, uh, as Nick said, a few months ago, we just came back, was the first thing we did, Andy Price, uh, took us for a ride around to see the old area. Much has changed. Much has not changed. And we went to see our old house, but I wanted you to see where we lived for the next, what, nine, nine years or so, nine and a half years, something like that. Love that house. Well, this is me doing an experiment, and yes, I had hair at one time uh, in, in the laboratory. Uh, we were required as graduate students to wear shirts and ties for good reason. If a guest came in from, or a dignitary from a foreign country, we want to look presentable for that uh, guest. So I always had a, a tie hanging in a locker right near my laboratory. You go in and put the, the tie on. But now someone was going to take my pictures for something. So I made sure the tie was there. This was interesting. While working for the Upjohn Company, I was their pharmacologist in a respiratory area. Those of you that may have had asthma or COPD, I was the only pharmacologist in the entire Upjohn company working on these diseases. I was proud to be in that group. And I wrote prolifically for journals. And one journal called me and said, we'd like you to write a review article on a new set of drugs called prostaglandins which are substances that occur in every cell of your body and have something to do with the activity of your body or also the disease in your body. They're involved somehow. So I wrote a nice review article. They said, you know what? We'd like to take some pictures of you for this journal. This journal was called the American Pharmacy Journal. It was 1979. And they said, we'll go a step further. Let's take you to this hospital called Bronson Hospital, which was across the street from where my lab was. And let's take a couple of pictures. We're not sure we can use the pictures with the article, but let's do it anyway. Well, this is the first picture they took of me, the scientist working with one of the animal species that we were working with, uh, Mr. Guinea Pig. You all sort of hear the expression. Uh, I'm not a guinea pig. Well, that guinea pig was a guinea pig, so he got involved in this. And then the second picture they took was this one. That was a child that was suffering from a disease for which I, as a scientist, was working on something to help that disease. So the, the whole background to the article was, here's who's working and who's who benefiting from the work that's being done. This was now put on the cover page of this journal without my permission and circulated around. Well, the management came and they didn't want publicity. And I said, I never asked you to be put on a Cover page. I didn't even know they were going to put it with the article. But it caused quite a bit of a hullabaloo when it first came out. But to this day, it hangs now in our apartment upstairs, the original journal piece. Uh, and I'm very proud of that. I'd love to find out whatever happened to that 
child since that's, what, 24 years old or 45 years ago. Probably doing some good work, I hope. While working at Uncle John also, I just wanted to share with you uh, something that was uh, very amazing. In our first trip back a few years ago, one of the people that sat where you're sitting was my mother-in-law. More family ties to uh, the village. And her name was Selma Price, for any of you that knew Selma. She was having her 90th birthday party, I think right in this room, right, Andy, right in this room? Um, and while we were here, I said, I want to just drive around, I want to see what's going on. So that was the building I was working on, on Henrietta Street. But what I noticed was, on top of the building, if you can read it there, it says OHA, but it actually says Upjohn Company. But on the bottom of the building, it says, Bronson Hospital. And at first I was confused, what, what happened here? So I went in to speak to the person at the front desk and said, I used to work here very proudly. Can I go up and see where my old laboratory was? And they said, no, 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 this is part of Bronson Hospital now. And it's an administrative building. You can't just walk in. So I never got to go inside. But I was left with the fact that I could take a picture of it outside where it still says Up John. They didn't want to do anything with that top frame even though it says Brunson on the bottom. Now it's, yeah, it's John Street on the bottom. But I have quite a few memories. Nine and a half years, quite a few memories. But as I said, if you do good work, if you publish a lot, you go to scientific meetings, other people start jingling your phone. Would you be interested in a position at such and such? And one of the best positions that was jingled in front of us was with for a company called Smith Klein and French in Philadelphia. Now it's called Glaxo Smith Klein. One of these opportunities we couldn't pass up. At Upjohn, I had one laboratory technician. At Glaxo Smith Klein, they said we're going to start you. Start you with 87 people reporting to you in your pharmacology uh, environment. I said that that's a wonderful opportunity for future growth. So we accepted it, we moved on to the Philadelphia area. As part of this talk, I thought it'd be interesting because I'd never put this on paper before. My God, it was like the sheriff was asking this. <laughs> How many places we've lived, Cheryl and I? We've lived in York, New Jersey. Both of us were born there. We've lived in Hillside, New Jersey, Elizabeth, New Jersey. We not only lived there, but that's where I worked as a pharmacist. Galveston, Texas. I put Kalamazoo in capital letters because if you look at number 15, we're back to Kalamazoo again. We lived in Ambler, Pennsylvania. Well, I worked for uh, Smith Klein and French and now Laxo Smith Klein. Lawrenceville, New Jersey is Bristol Myers Squibb. Robbinsville, New Jersey is also Bristol Myers Squibb. And part time in Hoffman LaRoche which was in Nutley, New Jersey, near a giant stadium for any of the giant fans here. Then we moved to Cincinnati, Ohio. Cincinnati uh, at the time, and by the way, they're going to the Super Bowl now, so my heart is with them right now. Uh, that was for a company called Marion Merrill Dow. And later they became Herxt Marion Roussel. Then they became a company called Sanofi, and then Sanofi Aventis, and they are now merged and the headquarters are in New Jersey. So I was there many years before all these different uh, notations and change of names and mergers. I learned a lot about business working for the pharmaceutical industry. And then Stockton, New Jersey, beautiful place. There was a song too. Uh, there is a bell in Stockton. I forgot the, the words for this, but a lot of people there, of course, knew about it. It was right on the border of New Jersey and Pennsylvania one of the prettiest houses we've lived in. Then we moved to Atlanta, where I finished my career in the pharmaceutical industry with a small biotech called Atherogenics. Athero, you can imagine I was working on atherosclerosis, and that's the company that made me a senior vice president and chief scientific officer. Then Valencia, that's when we made the move, retired to Valencia, California. And when I retired, that's the part of that uh, 
title of the talk comes in, when uh, my old friends, old colleagues, old peers started calling me and said, now that you're not associated with any pharmaceutical company, would you like to do some consulting for us? Uh, we could use you to just do a little work, not encumber you with a ton of work, but just we have a couple of questions we have to answer. We know you, you're the one that can help us. Or we're putting together these FDA approvals and we need another set of eyes to look at what we're filing with the FDA. Or smaller companies would come to me and say, we found the drug for whatever. We found the drug. We don't know what the hell to do with it. I mean, because the compound progression is, is a thing that is not taught in schools, but then we have to live it through experience. And I had all these years of experience and they wanted to hire me as a consultant. So first of all, much of the work could be done at home. And I didn't have to fly off somewhere. Secondly, the monies that they would send me, some cases embarrassingly nice to have, we put in special funds for our vacations so we didn't have to touch our real money. And this was all vacation money. From Valencia, we moved to Calabasas, California. Now you're getting into high-end stuff here. And then back to Valencia for another move. I mean, I think the movers all knew us by first name at this time. And it's from Valencia that we packaged up in November and moved here to our present location. And we're delighted to be here with my peers and my colleague sitting in the audience. So we've gone through 15 different moves and we're still standing after all of these. <laughs> Very dreamy to say the least. This was just to show you the names of, and logos of the different companies that I've worked for. Starting with a friable pill of the Upjohn Company. Cheryl remembers as a child taking a, a Cherokee liquid. Uh, and I remember dispensing a lot of Upjohn products as a pharmacist. Now becomes Pfizer. SK and F Smith Klein and French becomes Glaxo Smith Klein. Then I joined Squib in New Princeton, New Jersey. It becomes Bristol Myers Squib. Then I went to Hoffman LaRoche, now it's Roche. Then I went to Herx Marion Roussel, which I said became uh, Marion Merrill Dow, and then uh, Aventis, then Sanofi Aventis, then back to Sanofi. They changed these names around. Uh, you, you can't keep track of it without a scorecard. And, and, and especially when I used to go to the scientific meetings and meet someone who worked for one of the predecessor companies. They said, oh sure, we're buddies, we worked for the same company. No, we didn't. It was a totally different company, but all within the umbrella of the original companies. Sanofi, Aventis, and there's the last company on the bottom right, Atherogenics, that I worked for. Just to show you a couple of personal pictures, I couldn't let this opportunity go away. Uh, hopefully they'll have an opportunity to come here. Uh, that's my son, our son, Rick. Rick is, damn it, you're a good-looking boy. Uh, Rick is an actor in Hollywood, and that's why he lives right outside of Hollywood now in Culver City. Uh, he's been in numbers of TV shows like Law and Order, 24. Um, uh, my mind is going drawing a blank. Uh, I would say probably about 10 or 12 different shows as a guest star. And he's, he's liked doing that work, and it pays very well. Then he got into the theater. He was trained to be a theater performer. And in the early 2000s, he goes for an interview in New York for a show that's running on Broadway. And he was newly out of graduate school with a degree in theater arts. And you had to sing as well as perform and he said, there's no chance I'm going to get this part. Then next day they called him back, and he got the role, the role of Scar in The Lion King. So any, any of you who have seen The Lion King on Broadway, he was in it for two years or three years, and he played some other roles during that time also. But that's one of the things that he was most proud of, and I was proud to say my son in The Lion King. In fact, every once in a while, I'll wear a zippered uh, sweatshirt down here, and it'll say the Lion King on the side, because that came when he was in the show. But from that show also, the word spread, he went to different shows. He was recently in a show in Malibu, uh, 
quote of something about Harry Houdini, and he played the role of Houdini, the magician, and was fabulous in that. And then most recently in Cleveland, at the Cleveland Theater, he played the role of Otto Frank in the diary of Anne Frank, and he got superlative reviews. And most recently now, he does voiceovers, and he's spectacular as a voiceover expert. Lots of commercials, lots of money flowing in because of it, and also uh, things he can relate to ch his children as well as other children and adults. He's the voice of Thor in video games and cartoons. He's the voice of the Hulk in video games and uh, television shows about the Hulk. And he noticed that it's so difficult sometimes if his family wants to go on vacation, he's gotta be in his home to do the voiceovers and send back to the studios. So he designed a portable uh, voiceover box, as it were. And he not only designed it, got together with a, a technician, and they're building them, and they're selling to anybody that does voiceovers. So it's become a cottage career for him. And he's the one that lives in Culver City. And again, I think if there were some mechanism by which we could get him here to uh, see us, it's a long ride from Culver City to here in Kalamazoo, but he loves it, and this is his home base. He was born here. He has, so watch this. Our son has two sons. Here's one of them. <laughs> this is Max. Cheryl always says his beauty is something he, she hasn't seen on this earth. Max is the older of the two sons, and this is Sam, who's the younger of the two sons. And we miss them both. Thank God for FaceTime and our computers. That's how we have to keep up with them and see how tall they are. They'll show us how they measure how tall they're getting. But it's a little difficult, uh, and I'm sure all of you have experienced that with your loved ones. And I mentioned we have one other child who's our daughter, this third daughter, Dana. She's the clinical psychologist who lives in Vancouver, British Columbia. And our daughter has two daughters. So we have a son who has two sons, a daughter who has two daughters, and that's Belle on the left, and that's Sarah on the right. And they love it in Vancouver. They love the, the weather. It's, it's winter, they have a winter there, but they don't have a winter look outside right now. They're just something else. I forgot, living in California, I forgot what I was looking at out there. It's, uh, it's beautiful, but when I had to shovel my own driveway, that was a different experience in my life. But luckily, living in here, I use Cheryl, and I like that. <coughs> That's Cheryl. On the left, on the right is Selma Price, if anybody remembers her. And where they're having the party, as I understand, was in this room. Yeah, like I'm looking at the, the lights around the room. It was right in here. That was for her 90th birthday. Uh, that was the last time I had seen her. She passed away a few years ago now. But I wanted to show you this in case anybody remembers it. My understanding is people come up to us now while we're having dinner. We'll say to Cheryl, was Selma your mother? And she'd say yes. I said, how about me? You know, my mother-in-law. <laughs> Do I take any credit for that? <laughs> but uh, I thought I would just drop that in. That's our son Rick in the background. It was a wonderful dinner we had for her. Just one word about travel, and then I want to get onto some what I'm doing in-house for fun and wanted to share with you. We've gone to some exotic places. In addition to the places that invite me, like an invitation from um, Brisbane, Australia, Queensland, come for a week, oh, sure. Oh, and bring your wife, we'll pay for your wife. And, or we go to Hawaii, or we go to uh, Florence, Italy, or we go to Paris, France. Oh, bring, bring your wife, you're not gonna leave your wife at home. So they, we had lots of vacation trips paid for by the invitors, as we were the invitees and beneficiary. This one, they, they didn't pay for, because this one really put a hole in your pocket to go on this one. It's an Abercrombie and Kent vacation, 12 days, called Under South African Skies. And you're looking at a semi-habitual uh, elephant that we heard a lot about. They live out in the in savannah, and one person takes care of them, Groups go and they meet the animal and they can take 
pictures and walk the animal around and have fun. That was just a few years ago. We had a lot of fun. I don't think my physical well-being can tolerate walking with a group like that. And I remember we did walk with them for about a mile, and only one person in our group had a rifle with him. And I was pleased to see the rifle. On the other hand, he said, you know, we never need it if that elephant's walking with you. Oh. That any big cats are not going to come near you when they see that elephant. And that elephant stayed with us the entire one mile trip that we took. And there were several times where the, o the owner, sort of the father of those uh, elephants, would put his trunk on our shoulders as we're walking to show like he, they, they belong to me, keep away. But we've had lots of trips, lots of travel, exotic places I wish more companies would call. Uh, if I could do some more consulting work, well, I'd be glad to go to uh, you know, Greenland or the Arctic Circle or Antarctica. I'd be glad to go to, but there are no pharmaceutical companies there. <laughs> I'm out of luck. Now, to finish, I wanted to show you some of the things that I'm doing or have done in the past that might be of some interest to you and that speaking with Nancy, I might find a mechanism by which I hang some of my pictures. I cartoon and I do, do caricatures many years, starting with cartoon characters of the Bugs Bunny type and the Walt Disney type, but I copy them. I look at a small picture and I would draw it real large, coloring with magic markers and colors, and I've had them for a number of years. I probably have between 100 and 150 of them. I selected out just a few to flip and show you, and I'm continuing it while we're here with Mr. Simon, who's in our, who teaches our art class here at the village. But here are just a few that you might recognize. Now again, these are caricatures, so you may not recognize all of them. Everybody knows who's that? That's it, right? Uh, tell me yes, please. <laughs> okay, good. So, Star of Now Voyager, Jezebel, All About Eve. Very good, thank you. Yeah, please holler up the answer. Oh, that's an easy one, right? Club Gable. That was a tough one, because a lot of people didn't know who that was. Peter Lorre. Oscar is that. I heard Peter, Peter Lorre. Lorre. Very good. Yes, and Peter, darling. <laughs> this was a hard one for some people. This was Peter O'Toole. Lawrence of Arabia. That came out dark. Joan Rivers. Joan Rivers. Very good. Thank you. Too much makeup. <laughs> this was hard for a lot of people because this gentleman, who's a fantastic actor, just died a couple of years ago. But in all of his movies, he always wore a toupee. Uh, his name was Bond. That's Sean Connery. Yes, thank you. This is cute. Hepburn. Yeah, Audrey Hepburn. I mean, they have certain characteristics that make it enticing for me to draw. But by the way, when I sit down and draw these, they're usually done within a day or two. And the only reason there's a time space or element between it is because I usually get tired the first day and then say, oh, heck, I'll finish it the next day. Very good. Very sport of them. Marty, uh, a side adventure, uh, great actor. Won the Oscar for Marty. How about this one? I love this one. Probably my favorite director, and probably the greatest director of the 20th century, and maybe more. This is Steven Spielberg. Uh, what hasn't he done? This is Cheryl's favorite TV show, and the show our son was on is his first opportunity to get into uh, television. Jerry Orbach. Yeah. Jerry Orbach, very good. Yeah, and Sam Waters. Sam Waters. Law and Order, but I can't think of his name. Right. Sam Waters. Here, right, here's a piece of trivia to take away from this with uh, Jerry Orbach. I, I, I forgot who told me this the other day, too, but they said, really? Yeah. Jerry Orbach, or, or someone was asking a question, it's a trivia question. What actor, musical performer, has starred as the lead musical performer in more Broadway shows than anyone else in history? And it's Jerry Warbeck. 
and he's been in like 20 or 30 musicals on Broadway as the lead actor, lead performer. Phenomenal singer, phenomenal dancer, and actor you see him on Law and Order. And what he does. <laughs> See, does he look like that? <laughs> yes, that old Uncle Albert. <laughs> this I finished just uh, about a, a year ago. Uh, I did it in pencil, and I was going to color it in, I decided not to. But that's uh, The Godfather, Marlon Brando, Vito Corleone. And the last one, I believe the last one's coming up now uh, in conclusion. It was one that I'm still finishing up, putting the finishing touches on. This is the one Mr. Simon's helping me with. Whoop, oh, that's Mel Brooks. Was this one? Alfred Hitchcock. Oh, that's Alfred Hitchcock. I, I, I think I messed up the bird a little bit. That's supposed to be a crow. Maybe I, I will have to put some black ink on that to make it look more like a crow. But that's Alfred Hitchcock, very good. And, um, more to come. I probably have, again, about 100 to 150 of these, and most of them are cartoon characters. But I want to make sure that I thank you for your attention and sharing with me my journey from beginner, the hospital, to coming here to Friendship Village. And wait, there was one more, I think. One more? Oh, yeah. Hey, 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 hey. That's all, folks. Nancy, do we have time for a couple of questions? Absolutely. Yep. Questions yep. from anybody? Go ahead. Pardon? Go ahead. Oh, okay. Anybody have any questions? Questions? No questions? You were so thorough. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I never did this. Uh, never, no one ever asked me to go to a medical meeting, scientific meeting, or even a high school, you know, something or other for my children. And say, why don't you talk to us about your life and your career? I never had to do that. So with Dick's help, we put together that paragraph or two that you, you saw in the uh, newsletters. And now to do this, this it was, it's hard to do, hard to remember. Am I leaving something out, or what, what, what was important that I should have stayed, or, or what did I put too much in? But I tried to make it about 45 minutes and we succeeded. We've got a question over here. We've got a question. What was most satisfying of all your career? Is there one time that was the most satisfying? Mm -hmm. I, I do, and thank you for the question. I do answer this in, in a way that's very important to me. And, and it sounds trivial to others, but I, I worked all these years, probably the better part of 40 years in the pharmaceutical industry. And I have hired people out of graduate school. I've hired people with one or two years of experience. And by the time I left the pharmaceutical industry, they had ascended to positions in other companies as high as my position or higher. So, I mean, for me, I walk away saying, that's my legacy. Because when they're giving talks, and they say, well, like this, well, I studied with uh, Marty Wasserman at Upjohn, or, and I owe my career to, Etc. So that's probably the, the, the greatest takeaway for me is that and my family. But Thank it, you. Okay. Thank you. The photo of you and the baby is so touching, and the way that baby is looking at you is it just reveals. <laughs> so much or it says so much I was wondering what happened to the baby. I was wondering what, what drug you were working on at the time and what condition the baby had and, and what came what happened to that baby? <laughs> baby did well. Baby was receiving it was what tetralogy of flow was the disorder was that it was tetralogy of flow and they needed something to dilate some of the blood vessels. The drugs I was working on were that category called prostaglandins, and one of them I was working on for asthma. But the drug that I was working on could also be used for the tetralogy of Fallot. Now, I wasn't there when they administered to the baby, but they saw remarkable changes in her health. My understanding was that she left the hospital, had a, has had a great life. 
She never got back to me. I never got back to her. But as I said, she's got to be 40 something years old and we have a tree and a half. Now that we're back to Kalamazoo, if somehow I, there was a mechanism that I could find out who that was. But for me, that was the only time I was ever on the cover of a magazine, except maybe crime and punishment. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the question. Well, thank you, Marty, for a very uh, informative and entertaining program. Thanks. Next month, March 2nd, we will have Bob Andrews, who will present, I Can Do That Job. Now, boys and girls, Go out, have fun playing in the snow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.